<laughs> okay, well, welcome members to um, Team Yoga Book Club. The book is Mastery. If you haven't read it, um, you don't need to because we'll discuss it for you. How many um, people have read it? <laughs> yeah, this is a poll, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the new I, version. Is that a new version? Yeah. Right, okay, he's got yeah. a new version, right. I was actually wanting to interview, I mean, George, um, and I looked him up and he's died a few years ago, unfortunately. Um, but then when you read it, you obviously, when I reread re it more recently, I realised actually he's talking about, you know, I think he was talking about flying planes in the Second World War, wasn't he? So I should have known that, you know, he actually was pretty old. <laughs> um, but it's a shame because uh, he was around when I read it first of all. And this book was recommended to me by Chuck Miller. And I asked Chuck, I remember at Purple Valley, what, what book should I read about yoga, you know? And I was expecting, you know, Ashtabhaka Gita or something, you know you have a book and he said you'll read this you know and uh, and I it stuck with me ever since we've always you know wherever we've been and we've been quite kind of um you know itinerant over the years me and Teresa we've always carried this book of mastery around and I've you know I've, it's been really close to my heart as a practitioner um so really interested to hear your thoughts and um I don't know I mean I've got a few notes uh, where should we start off I mean um yeah I, I suppose the thing that always grabbed me if I just give a little intro to it is the idea of the plateau and you know, and being comfortable with the plateau seems the seminal idea of the book, um, and it's not something that we have that we're well structured for in society. And, he, and he, in fact, more recently looking at it again, he actually talks about it. Um, the idea, how does he call it? Um, the end of the path of the endless climax. He says on page thirty, and this is really what society is aiming for now, isn't it? And uh, to, in, you know, in terms of selling us stuff, experiences uh, ourselves, really. Um, and specifically now when you've got the mobile phone in hand, you really don't have a moment's um, time to yourself and being comfortable with boredom even or with being in the normal everyday life is not an experience which I think the newer generation are at all um, accepting of. That, that, that that's something that everyday life might even exist, right? Um, so this idea of the plateau and this idea of being comfortable on the plateau and practice is, I think is, is the fundamental root of practice for me. Um, so he says, most people brought up in the society, the plateau can be a form of purgatory. You know? it that's a strong term. It triggers disowned emotions. So that's interesting, right? And um, the idea that we're using um, excitement and, and progress to distract ourselves from our own selves. It's, uh, you know, kind of obvious yogic trope, really. Um, so, the, you know, progress does, you know, distract us, right? You get caught up in identifying yourself with accomplishment. So um, it... Being on the plateau, actually, and being, you know, and especially, say, for someone like, you know, Giovanni's current situation, and for me as well, I really hurt my shoulder a number of years ago, being on the plateau, or even actually being off the plateau in a worse place than the plateau, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sliding downhill fast, is a painful experience, and it does trigger a lot of emotions. Um, but that's really what makes what we're doing not as simple or as superficial as the obvious body conditioning right um it's emotional you realize how you came to tennis he says you realize how you came to tennis not only to exercise but also to look good yeah that's in us all you know and i think an, in, acknowledging an aspect of yoga as conditioning and as vanity um although not something i would not like to hold my hand up to myself it still plays a role right we all you know are valued by the way we look these days um and he says finally um and not only to play with your friends but to beat your friends Right. Um, you know, and that's also a hard thing to uh, to admit that we actually in our yoga, as much as we're focusing on, it, you know, especially online these days, it's a bit easy. You don't have the competition as we did in the studio. But, you know, I mean, especially I think that male um, eat energy is more is still more aggressively competitive than female. But I see it in women as well. The inherent constant need to compare, contrast and essentially compete against each other and not for the sake of beating per se, I'm better than you, but even just in terms of just finding where you lie, I think just as much as we identify ourselves now through stimulation, through overexcitement, we've always identified ourselves through comparison and comparison comes in competition, right? We, I mean, this is a big thing of mine, really, and I'm going to write on social media in these current days and more and more, you know, about how we contextualize our own experience of consciousness. We, we make that experience of ourselves through finding the context of it by comparing ourselves and locating ourselves in space or society against others, right? And where we stand in that, in, you know, in that. So, um, yeah, as a little um, foray into the book, I mean, you know, I can, I have, and uh, I'm called cool to speak 
for longer periods of time. But um, you know, I'd rather not if uh, I, mean, I don't have to. So uh, if any, you know, if anyone else has a you know a particular quote that they like that like to discuss or a particular point that grabbed them, put your hand up, um, and uh, and I'll throw it over to you. Otherwise, you know. or a question. Yeah, or a question. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's so. I mean, so I'm, I'm just going to want to say that that. I really like also, I mean, there's many parts of the book I love, but another part that I really like is, you know, I wasn't sure how much I would speak about it today, but the, uh, the dabbler, the obsessive or the hacker, you know, and just finding which one you, you are, you know, and, um, you know, um, and I think, I think we've all been all of those in a way, right? I mean, I, I was never really so much a dabbler, but I've definitely been the obsessive and the hacker um, and the dabbler probably. The and dabbler, the dabbler. The dabbler. Possibly. Yeah, the dabbler. Not the obsessive, not the hacker, no. So the dabbler, I think, <laughs> or maybe none of them. Yeah, uh, dabbler. I'm always I think a dabbler. Yeah. Anyway, so um, you know, what are you, dabbler, obsessive, or hacker? Um, right. Okay. Any any um any little comments? Start up. Start the ball rolling. Elizabetta, I know you're always quite chatty. <laughs> or we can talk about the best of instructors, the worst of instructors. Um, which is <laughs> which is also a kind of a you know an interesting um an interesting part to read and all, and I've also had that experience of um when you know he talks about flying you know and in the best of instructors the worst instructors part he's talking about flying a plane and um, how you know he demands so much of these pet students he has right and then the other students are really sidelined and the you know and kind of humiliated and the pet students are a kind of he kind of puts too much of himself into those students and expects too much of them, not only expects too much of them, but kind of identifies his own accomplishment with their accomplishment. And, um, and as a teacher, I think that's a really, a really subtle point and a really interesting point to make that uh, that little part of the, uh, the good and bad um, teacher, right? And having just a more, finally having a, a slightly more balanced, uh, a balanced approach to the teaching in the end where he doesn't turn out these pet students and I've had those unfortunately or oh, not these students that you know are rubbish and don't really care about them either you know it's a, you know he becomes uh, you know a good teacher and then doesn't have people what is it in the dance when he went to a dance and this this uh, pilot started castigating him for, for hum his humiliating teaching um Nicola Um, I was just going to comment on um, on my my take on on that part of it, particularly in the Ashtanga world, about how important it is to find a teacher that you resonate with the way that they're teaching, because there are so many different ways from the overly dogmatic one, you know, that it's it's my way or the highway, to the complete other end of the scale, which is just completely do what you want and and kind of everything in in between and so it's and finding, yeah, yeah, yeah. finding yeah. that person that that's right for you which does take sometimes doesn't it a little bit of experimentation and also he already says i mean and he says and, and i also pulled this quote out when uh, eric and i can't say that word irreconcilable irreconcilable differences occur remember that it's better part of wisdom in knowing when to say goodbye you know and I think that's also true is that, you know, like everyone has their time and stage with you, you know, and I definitely, although it's hard to say goodbye to, to people, I think with a teacher, there's a natural flow, right? Like, you know, you have your time with that person and, and then, you know, things change and shift and, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, it's also really nice to acknowledge that there's always flux, you know, you find your person and you're so, you know, that, and, and I've had it with, with, you know, many people I could mention now, you know, and then at a certain point, you've kind of run your course and, and they need something else, you know, not something better, but just something different, you know, and that's, you know, as a teacher, it's kind of hard, but it's also a really valuable um, lesson to learn and to try and cultivate, so you don't, yeah. And as, as another thought on, on that theme as well, I know it's very, very frowned upon in Ashtanga to have more than one teacher, um, but I think sometimes you can get different things from different people at the same time. And I think as long as as long as you're honest in terms of, of you know, being able to to let them know that. And also in terms of, of saying what you like and why, so that you can understand each teacher's perspective on it, then 
I personally um, have found that very useful. I think it's a really hard thing for a teacher, to be quite honest with you. Um, and it's something you have to learn now as a skill because you didn't used to. And I think that the whole ballpark was very different when there were more students than teachers. And so it was like, you know, like a saturated, um, you know, now it's a saturated kind of housing market, right? So it's a bit that the balance of power has changed. And I think that that's a great thing, you know, that the balance of power is now with the student to decide and the teacher has to be much more compromising and understanding of, of these, the, the, there isn't one, you know, solution there in terms of a, one, you know, holy relationship, right? That, you know, it is a much more, democratic way of playing things but um yeah I mean it, you know it, to be patently honest it can be hard as a teacher especially if you're if your uh, teaching partner as it were with the student is of a very different mindset which bizarrely can happen I mean people can say oh I come to you and then they can give me a name that they're also going to see who's teaching in completely different fashion you know and, and then I think well how do you re reconcile those perspectives or how do you have interest in me and this person as well you know and, and, you know, but, um, it, you know, it does happen. And I think it's also because the longer you go on, I think it's less about necessarily what you say and the information you give and just something which you're conveying, which is beyond the immediate, you know, attempting to convey, right? Like that's being picked, like an energy that, that people are interested in. Um, but yeah, I think that's, that is a really good point these days that we come to a point where, a number of teachers you've got all this information out there and um picking and choosing is is a uh, you know an incredible luxury that, that this kind of online system at least has has allowed us to do particularly you know and i always said i wanted people to to use the online format to dip in with me and then to go elsewhere and to go elsewhere but you know i'm just like i'm saying you know let's be in an open relationship you know it's you know <laughs> It's a nice idea in theory, but it, it's still, you know, it, it, in practice, it's, you know, it still can, uh, you know, rub, you know, yeah. Well, it's about taking responsibility for your own path, isn't it, on there, in, in, rather than trying to make yourself a, a copy of your teacher. And sometimes in order to do that, you need to see other things to be able to realise what it is about your main teacher that you you actually really value and the the you know and and that again on the on the path to mastery working out your own way to do that yeah yeah um amelia oh, hi uh sidestepping a little bit to um something adam in that you introduced about the kind of the core of the book and the idea that um uh, you know, it's about the plateau and about the practice. And there's a, a little quote that says, well, I think it's quite often mastery is practice and it's staying on the path. And also um, the book talks a lot about not having goals. And um, I've been dabbling a bit in rowing. I've got a rowing machine. And just as a personal example, I sort of had a bit of a lull. I hadn't been doing it a few months and I've been having this mental kind of, ah, oh, I haven't been doing it and you know, why not? And I need to set some goals and blah, blah, blah. And then this morning for the first time in a few months, I was like, well, I'm just going to not have a goal and not even look at the silly screen that tells you how many meters and how many calories and how much time and just, you know, forget the whole aim of distance or time or anything. Um, and just set the machine up with a nice view and just didn't look at the clock and didn't care. And actually I just sort of more experience and I guess it was kind of a plateau but the whole point was it was it was goalless but in a way it felt it had a bit more meaning and just resonance with with enjoyment and just yeah, yeah. With, with your embodied experience which is yeah what, exactly yeah. And, and it was quite a conscious shift from like right I'm going to sit yeah. and I'm going to do 2,000 meters and it's going to take me this long and I'm going to measure and I'm going to watch my yeah. heart rate and everything and it was a lot more of a kind of yoga approach to it than yeah. having a fitness plan to do this but it actually got me back on the machine having that perspective and I think to me it's a lot about it's just practice it's, it's the doing it it's just do it <laughs> it doesn't need to have a goal or an aim or you know um so yeah oh, well, those aim shift as well you know or yeah. you know uh, amend and shift and change and you know and 
But I think the goal is, the interesting point is you re to recognise that the goal is always a substitute and a poor one at that for an immediate experience of self. Yeah. You know? When you've got that, is a goal is completely redundant and irrelevant, right? Why would you, if you're embodying yourself in an experience of self which is felt, mm. even if it's not perfect, mm. that experience is always found adequate, you know, and never yeah. an outside goal or experience. Um, yeah, and, I think, mm, and I think I realized it was a bit um, egoic. It was just ego, like, oh, how far could you know, having the ideas that I might row this far and it might take this long? And it was like, how many calories can I burn? Yeah, exactly. Was like, well, it wasn't really about kind of distance and time, but it, it just, why? What's the point? Like, I'm just going to row because I want to row. And if I don't want to, then yeah. fine, but not to get in a spin about it. Anyway, so maybe that's me. <laughs> uh, so I like the, um, the, uh, the pun as well. Uh, unintentional pun and getting don't get a spin about it um <laughs> the same monia isn't on because monia likes to actually likes a spinning class which i mean i don't come at the weekends to yoga because I, I do spinning which i mean you know, it's i think you can use the same principles of yoga rather i don't know i'm not all altogether a fan of synthesizing or oh, it's all yoga you know it's all the same i do think there's something specific to to, to this particular discipline which is interesting um but I do think you can use a lot of the same principles in any embodied movement, you know, and certainly when you've established that foundation in this movement, then I definitely think that now I apply them in a different way when I do other forms of movement that perhaps I would never have before. Like, like I don't listen, I, I can't listen to music when I'm cycling or doing anything else that's not yoga because I'm still doing something which that feels like it, it, it pollutes. It feels like it's, uh, it, 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 it uh, sullies, it compromises that experience of moving, you know, putting the music on. So, you know, um, I wanted to kind of um, quote to you, Amelia, on your point. Um, for perhaps the, I posted this today on social media, actually. Perhaps my favourite quote I had recognised at the time was, for one who is on the master's journey, the word practice is best conceived of as a noun, not something you do, but something you have or something you are. I thought well, that was really poetic and I really liked that a lot. So the idea of practice as something, not even something you do, but something you have and something you are. So I think that idea that you're returned, and I found that really, really helpful to be honest, if I'm honest and upfront, when I was 20 and I was having trouble with anxiety and depression, and I was put on antidepressants and the practice really saved me and it managed to get me off those, those drugs. Because I knew that they were, every day I would come to a place where I would go back to myself as something and as experience of myself as I was. And that was a, a sense of having something supporting me behind myself that, um, yeah, I, I found absolutely instrumental to, uh, to the recovery that I made, you know, uh, that I, something I was, not just something I did to feel better, but something, a path that I was kind of embodying, yeah. Um, and that idea of, of embodying a lifestyle, embodying a, a perspective or a way of living, I think is something which you can, you can continue, however your practice shifts and changes and amends, or even if you're not able at certain points, me or Giovanni, to actually do physical practice. It's the lifestyle and the idea of being situated in a practice of living itself i.e. routine, pattern, lifestyle, that, you know, I think is, is the unique thing of, especially of this particular yoga as well, you know, um, before I let Nicola speak again, um, I was speaking to um, a guy, um, you might know him or not, I'm not going to mention the name, who was a yoga teacher, who uh, wanted to speak to me about um, his hips hurting, he's 67 for God's sake, but um, he's, he needs a hip replacement, basically, but he's, afraid that he if he has it he won't be able to practice certain postures and um he feels if he doesn't practice in exactly the way that he learned from patabi joyce then he's not doing ashtanga yoga and that he had that that he's no longer situated in that in that lifestyle and that perspective and i i just i don't think i got through to him but i think it, yet but i think it's such a shame because above and beyond the literal situating of sequences is something which which is a, you know a practice which transforms you which which you have and it's a perspective and it's a lifestyle choice and it's a way of living and it's nothing to do with whether you practice or can or can't practice certain postures 
in a certain sequence, you know. Um, Nicola. And then there's the chat. I was just following on from Amelia's point, really, in terms of one of the, the things that I really liked in the book was where he said that if you look at people who have really mastered, be it their sport or whatever it is that they do, the reason that they've done that is because they just practice for the joy of practicing and they just love doing the practice, whatever the outcome, the outcome comes as a consequence of them loving practicing what they do. And I thought that that was such a such a lovely way of making you think about not going for the goal that will come of its own accord after putting in the, the basics. And that's sort of what we do, isn't it? Day after day after day, put the basics in and just kind of hope that at, at some point they... <laughs> Something will happen. Yeah. <laughs> Enlightenment, maybe. I mean, I think one thing that the people often miss with the yoga is that you train to a certain level every day you don't train to 100 percent. just like any kind of you know body discipline an athlete wouldn't train 100 percent every day you know you're doing your foundations every day day in day out you know you don't actually throw it all out every day and i think that's you know a point which you know i've thought about more recently you know vis-a-vis -vis, say mysore where you go for a period of time and um you could be training to your edge every single day and it's uh depletive and it's uh you know ruinous really you know and, and you know and i certainly don't think that should be and then teachers come back and obviously they've had a certain experience in my soul inevitably that translates to the way they teach and um and with many uh pitfalls but this is one of them that you know we really um we need to recognize that you know we do those foundations every day but we certainly we're building a foundation and then now and again you have this peak experience or you know or this you know 100 percent you know effort day you know when you feel you can you're light and you're happy and you're excited you know but uh day in day out we, we shouldn't really expect that you know um on Lizabetta has made a great point on um the challenges of the plateau challenging as well as plateau and i think that's like you know it's easy isn't it to get into this idea oh you know just be content with where you're at and it's like you know it can always also kind of slip into kind of a fatalistic deterministic like you know i don't want don't want to make progress you know i'm not egoic i don't want you know don't want to go anywhere um and you know and i think it's also good to to recognize we can still have realistic little goals right you know and also know where to set your goals right like you know because when i started i kind of compared myself to john scott you know being such being a bit of a crazy person and also better than john competitive and egoic i john was my teacher and um you know and as john did as well john competed with derek you know um and they fell out in the end over that you know um and i competed with john um and um you know i think having realistic goals as well because i'm nowhere as proficient as john you know um it was also re reasonable and and relevant and and to acknowledge that we do have goals and i mean and um george the book we're reading, George Lennon says, um, you know, um, playing the edge is a balancing act on page 99, you know, and I've also marked that down because there is this necessity. I mean, it's when people often ask, why are all these sequences there then? You know, if we're talking about yoga as coming back to what is and accepting yourself and, you know, and all these, you know, kind of yogic esque kind of, then why are we called to kind of increasingly kind of, you know, play the edge? But I think, you know, it's just part of human nature that, you know, a, a rolling stone gathers no moss, as we say, um, you know, uh, you know, you know, you, you have to keep going. And Krishna says the same, you know, fair, he says fair forward, you know, like you can't look back and you can't stay in one place. It means we're kind of called to, to keep, to keep going and keep trying and keep persevering and keep, you know, but you know, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Or not a double-edged sword, but at least to Elizabeth's point, you know, it's a balancing act between, acceptance okay here i am with a certain body i'm not john scott i've got a kyphosis in my upper back john hasn't and you know and on the other hand you know like yes i want to get better you know i want to do those postures that i saw and you know and and how to reconcile the two you know um well i, I cast that over to anyone who's got any any thoughts of how they've done it but you know i mean for me it was just simply a question of time and you know and um you know usually unfortunately you have to learn the hard way like um i mean 
just I'll stop in a sec, but I mean, that brings me to mind the parable of the four horses in Suzuki. He mentions D.T. Suzuki, who's the famous Zen teacher, right? He's written great books if you haven't read D.T. Suzuki's Beginner's Mind or a book like that. It's a fantastic book on meditation and Zen. Anyway, he talks about these four horses, right? And the one, the best horse, I think, is the one that sees the whip and he doesn't even need to crack it, you know, and he, he responds, you know. And the worst horse, you know, the, whipped and whipped and whipped and still you know like you'll only do it at the last moment you know and i think um for many of us it's that we're, we're unfortunately the worst of horses um certainly i was but um you know hopefully we learn more quickly from our mistakes um but thanks elizabeth for that idea because it's important to also to play the edge and to have those goals as well as as well as accepting the plateau um stop me at any point if you're david Jessica David. Hello. Hello. Uh, I feel like uh, in, in my person, I am uh, always a bit uh, pushy in my practice, or I have been pushy. And I feel like when I have like kind of realistic goals, it's something healthy and good. But when I have these greedy goals in my practice is when you cross that line. And I think that even he talks, I don't remember, he talks a little bit about this, even in the book, but it's these greedy goals that take you across these borders, you know, like... Uh, Great way to say it, yeah, yeah, I like that. Yeah. yeah, 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 I might use that if you don't mind. No, it's nice, yeah. I think, um, so. yeah, I mean, I think so. And, and I think you know it when it's happening as well. Like, I remember when I met my main teacher, Mark Darby, I've, I've got the greedy goal of... In, uh, having a completed advanced aid but I, I didn't really feel this sequence and I didn't really feel it was mine and I didn't really feel like I embodied it I just wished to push and get it and do it and I didn't really feel it to be honest I wasn't embodied in it and I think that's the difference between a goal that you earn properly that is your own authentic path and one that's a greedy goal is mm -hmm. that you kind of the greedy goal doesn't really feel like your own it feels like you kind of stole it you know and uh, yeah, and you haven't kind of come into it properly. Um, but yeah, that's a, yeah. I mean, I think it's a really fine edge, isn't it? Between a sensible goal and a realistic goal, and, you know, and and something which is just pushing, you know, and you know, I see it, I've seen it in your practice, David, just as I see it in my own, you know, that, you know, it's a, there's that, there's that pushing there, you know, and that's, that's just part of it, isn't it, you know? Actually, um, this, this book is helping me to, yeah, to slow down a little bit, uh, yeah. to just, uh, yeah, it's helping me a lot to just enjoy what I'm doing and not having too much these uh, big goals into my practice and just uh, slow down a little bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I mean, when I again, I, I'll. I'll praise Mark Darby to the cows come home really because he gave me the primary series again and and that was then enough because I felt what I was doing in it and you know, ever since that point I never really had those greedy goals really when I went to Mysore I was given those more postures because that's kind of what happens in Mysore but I never really desired them in the same way as I did before because I felt what I was doing in the series finally and that really felt adequate in a way that it really hadn't before. Ali work out your unmuting yeah. hi everybody hi. i'm sorry i'm working from a small smartphone and i've got the fat right. finger yeah and you have to go into another screen etc cetera, etc cetera. um i just wanted to say i i absolutely loved this book i thought it was fantastic um and i i got it in audio format yeah did and he um, did he read it yeah it wasn't him it was right. a stand-in which okay. is a shame but uh um, and I actually listened to it while I was doing my Ashtanga practice. I don't know if that's allowed. Something sure. other people sure do. Or We're not. Have to well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have to say I'm in good company because I quite often listen to Keen on Yoga. So, uh, you know, to the podcast. So um, I absolutely loved the book. I thought it was brilliant. Um, very simple, very kind of homespun. And, and yeah. Um, and, so true uh and the, and the bit about plateaus like you know like everyone else is saying is just chill out and enjoy the plateau I, I don't know if that's the same as do your yoga and all is coming i don't know um yeah if that yeah. means something or not 
um yeah so I, I i really enjoyed the book i thought it was great oh fantastic yeah, yeah. it's lovely to be able to share it you know i mean i really want i was thinking then i want to send this to chuck and see what he makes of it you know um because yeah it was really him that started me on this uh on the book and it's i mean you know it's a practice is where we're at with you know like trying to keep up and find a way to sustain a practice which is constantly rejuvenating and fresh and new and doesn't become turgid or obsessive or stuck you know and um it's yeah it's a kind of a fascinating trajectory um i thought i actually uh, that brings me on to a point that i kind of liked um i can't, i liked uh, page 81 he says the courage of of a master is measured by his willingness to surrender uh uh, uh, and, and to, to render hard a hard uh, earned proficiency in order to reach a different level i thought that was really interesting i mean these days one we don't really don't like talk of devotion and surrender that really frightens the you know a, a, a western perspective that's you know really done with church and, and religion you know devotion surrender like, you know like we're you know but i think that's part of it and how we frame that in the practice is an interesting question um and i think what I wanted to say, so that's a question if anyone has anything to say about that and their ideas of devotion or surrender in practice. But I think also this idea, and I really like this one, that you get on a plateau and you'll stay on it for a while. And then what will happen is actually you'll often have a big drop in that plateau and it'll, you'll get worse. And, that, and, and that's like, you have to come into that space of rebuilding again. And I really like the phoenix from the, from the ashes um, the symbolism because oftentimes... To, to get that next stage up, you have to really break. And, and, you know, unfortunately, not for everyone, but for me and for others I know, what you had. And so this idea of a real proficiency in surrender and dropping what you've had to gain something new is fundamental. I mean, again, Suzuki actually uses the cup, right? And he's um, this famous, uh, I don't, how do you call it, parable or analogy that he he's actually in with a student and he's pouring, pouring, you know, the tea and it's overflowing the cup for the student, you know, and the, the students say, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, he says, well, you know, like, you know, you're not ready to listen to anything, right? You, your cup's already full, so I can't put anything else in it, you know? And I think that in order to come to a new stage, you have to drop off on that old knowledge, which you're really holding on to and proud of because you worked hard at it. And that was certainly my case with, with meeting Darby because he really broke my practice and um, and uh, you know put me in a very um, difficult state of, uh, of of emotionally, you know, having held on to something that had really got me through a tough time, and then to be told that it was basically rubbish and that <laughs> and, and, you know was really hard, you know. Um, but it's that made where I am today. I mean, you know, there's a, you know we go through these drops, and then I had another one at 38, 39 when when I did my shoulder in, you know. And, uh, and, and you have to break everything sometimes and then you build up. So as the plateau isn't, a, isn't necessarily a straight line. It often you go right down and into an incubation period, into a hibernation, into winter, you know, and then you, you build yourself up in a fresh way, you know, like, like a new skin of a snake, you know. I think that's, that's uh, an important part of the journey as well. Catherine. Oh, yeah, I feel like I'm really at the beginning of stuff again, really, in a way, because, um, I mean, my, my practice after doing um, several, I don't know how long, I've no idea how long, but of a shanga, and then um, ending up trying to get to my soul, but ending up um, sectioned on the way and practicing for about a year in hospital on and off over a couple of years. And um, so, um, and that was all just obsessive and trying to like be my teacher and trying to do the things in primary series and I got through primary series most a lot of primary series and um but this is completely fresh this is doing it now is it, it's just a different I mean what, what you was everything you're talking about from the book about I haven't, I haven't read the book but everything you're talking about about um the greedy goal and um what else are you talking about um just I mean injury and um being proud of something and wanting to um, hold on to that. And then also the fear of my family because of getting injured and, and, and just battling against that. I mean, that's been huge. Um, I've still got that now, you know, slightly. And, um, but, um, you know, I've got, I've got a practice that it just, you know, it's, trans it's transforming my, my goals and, mm. and, and um, 
uh, like aims and vision and stuff, and just um, really coming, coming, coming to God and stuff as well. And it's just, mm. you know, yeah, it's really, it's really um, just been fantastic. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, it means a lot to me. I mean, coming to the practice, me for mental health reasons, um, and knowing how well it works for me, um, it's my biggest. Uh, goal and, and, and gratitude to, to help anyone else with it you know because I know it works and I know that commitment to to a daily thing when you come back to a space which feels safe and yours and peaceful for a little while um you know that helps so much for the rest of the day at certain points when you know things are feeling really awful to know that there's a point in the day where you're there and grounded and it's your space that held me and kept me going you know in really difficult times um yeah and knowing how to treat that also when you're practicing so it so it invites in the best possible progress as well you know so it doesn't become too obsessive or rigid or you know injurious um yeah um yeah he also talks about homeostasis uh, which is really interesting on page 114 the idea that our body and our minds regulated and um that you know we actually we need to know how to keep the regulation but also when to to kind of break it to a new level right so you have to first of all you have a backlash right the backlash is injury right so you're praying you know you've got a homeostasis and that kind of homeostasis kind of works to a level right like it you know kind of works and doesn't work but it's a regulated imbalance right and then with the yoga you're kind of tampering that that dial and often there's a backlash right like you know things can be gonna like, feel a bit worse than before like you know emotionally can feel worse sometimes and physically you've got a little limp now and you know you know like backs a bit out you know and i mean and so there is a backlash when you're trying to regulate you know because the body is a heat-seeking missile for homeostasis it's always trying to keep create the same thing right your blood you know your temperature everything is always trying to and the, the mind as well but we're not content with that rigidity neither in the body nor the mind we also have to evolve so i mean even biologically we're situated in this very difficult position where the mind's always looking for familiarity for solidity for rigidity and and the body is as well right for safety right mentally and uh, physically you know and yet as an organic being we're called to evolve you know the the nature of being is that it's a fluid uh, embodied state which never remains the same so i think the idea of homeostasis he mentions which is really interesting is that you know gradually you chip away at this homeostasis and you're able to kind of change the dial a little bit without creating you know too much irregularity or or, or chaos right i mean he talks about um you know how to do this right so you know first of all you need to negotiate it right you know first of all you need to understand that there is a backlash that you know practice doesn't always make you feel great that you know the work the regulating homeostasis can make you feel worse sometimes before you feel better because you're going in these different troughs and peaks and secondly you know you need to negotiate that right you know like it's a dialogue it's a constant dialogue between you and yourself and how to regulate your practice like add a little take a little do this do that see you know there's no one way you know so you need to negotiate it and thirdly, you need a support system, right? You know, this is what we're doing here, right? You can't do this. Well, you can do this on your own, but it's a lot harder. You know, you need to feel that you're supported by other people. I mean, going back to that time for me, I was in the Midlands in Leamington Spa, and, um, you know, having a group there, you know, I mean, I still, I mentioned the place and where I was because that, that group for me and the names and the people there, you know, they're still so dear to my heart, you know, because... I saw those people every day, you know, and even if you don't see them and you're in line with me, you hear the names and, you know, like there's something in it, you know, there's something in it. Just, just knowing those people are there with you, that means a lot. And, it, you know, and that still means a lot to me, those people now, you know, um, having that support system, you know, it's huge. The Sangha in Buddhism, right, you know, is that, you know, you need to have that community, you know, it's hard as an individual. And then regularity, you know, to turn up consistently, consistently in your attempt at homeostasis you you can't just order the whole thing too quickly right you know you need regularity and you need it over a long time you know you need to be regular and you need it over a long time you know you don't want to just alter the whole radiator you know in one day and then you know the whole pipes explode right like you have to do it slowly and sequentially you know i mean that's Batavi joyce's favorite sutra was always i don't know whether we're allowed to mention Batavi joyce anymore if he's not completely shamed but you know he always quoted you know practice needs to be done you know 
number 12 sutra you know over a long time you know with the right attitude and consistently you know shatkara shepacha drukha and that practice is is drutha bhumihi it's well grounded it's uh, it's is rooted right so he's really talking about how to work with this homeostasis and need to, need for change so you know we're a being that needs to regulate but we're also a being that needs constant change you know Media. I'm just thinking as you talk there, I, I liked in the book how there were a few diagrams, like I'm quite visual and having the, um, you know, the sort of little curve and the, the description that we're a bit of a kind of, you know, climax seeking society going up, 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 and then he did the plateau thing. And I was just thinking while you talk there, maybe it's also kind of um, the long term goals. It's almost like we're just slowly, slowly maybe drawing a big circle and just we just, I don't know, we're in the middle. There are short term kind of wiggle, 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 like a kind of one of those, I don't know, thing that measures your heart going up and down or something. But if you go for the long term, you can just have a really long, smooth, round, sort of infinite line. Alternatively, you know, short term pursuit of stimulation or whatever is just a kind of crazy mess of lines. And just yeah. like visually, as, as for me in the book, that the, the few pictures there were were really quite, um, yeah, effective in, in giving getting the point across um, and it, it's almost like it's a whole different trajectory to think of the long term um, long term work as opposed to a short term and just having lots of little sort of steps <laughs> yeah I think that brings on to a good point of the intentionality and deepening intentionality right like first of all my own you know goal was just to you know not have any be taking medication to feel steady stable not depressed not anxious you know and, and function as a normal human being. That was just simply my goal, right? And then, you know, like you get to that level, right? And you think, well, you know, like, can I do a bit more than that maybe, you know, like, <laughs> can I, you know, can I achieve a little bit more, you know? So you constantly, you know, constantly kind of increasing or deepening that idea of what's your intention, your intentionality, right? Like, you know, and then it was like, okay, well, you know, can I get a bit like healthier? Can I get stronger? You know, how would it affect my physical system if I become vegetarian? Cause I wasn't, you know, I stop smoking and doing, you know, doing drugs or drinking, you know, will I feel like a deeper connection to myself or to God or to nature, you know? And so, you know, you start to kind of like sink in, you know, that intentionality, which he mentions, I think is fantastic because, you know, it's not something you can necessarily kind of cognate or even express, you know, but it, you know, it's a deepening of, of one's commitment to something which in the end i think does come to if anyone wants to speak or do my do me a service on, on the idea of devotion humility surrender that's that's definitely in the core of something in the practice but um you know not necessarily in the way that we might have situated it in you know in western religious terms you know um i mean his idea of intentionality um is the beautiful vision you know and i really like this actually just as a sidebar you know the, the beautiful vision of arnold schwarzenegger who um who coined the, the idea, right? You, you have to have a, pictures, pictures in the mind really help, you know, and a picture of yourself and how you want to be and where you want to be, I think is, um, you know, they, 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 and even how you're doing the asana, I always think in pictures, you know, and on, a, on a practical level. Um, David. Uh, just uh, had a, like a thought in my head now talking it's a bit changing the it's not changing the topic but by all means like uh, we talk about staying in the path you know so i had kind of a question for you and it's like staying in the path depends a lot of the practitioner and how much a teacher can influence to help the practitioner to stay into the path of the practice and how can the teacher help the student to just stick to it. Yeah. Uh, how much can you invade or kind of go into this really personal mm -hmm. uh, thing of the student to yeah. help him? Yeah. That's a great question. I mean, I'm always trying to scrabble around to try and, you know, come up with something sensible to say on that. I mean, because well, it's so different for each student, isn't it? Well, I don't think you can. I mean, I think what I come down to is all you can provide is a space and a support and a steadiness of presence. I mean, the idea, I'm not saying I'm a guru or that any teacher is a guru, but one, um, the etymology of guru comes from um, generally thought to come from heavy, heaviness, you know, that there's some 
sense of groundedness and you're there and as i often say to people when they say you know oh i'll see you when i say i'll be here you know i'll be here because i'm there every day and i think you know when i was at my store in person i was there every day you know and i even I, you know before covid obviously when we have to be careful but you know even when i was sick or you know or you know on or, or not feeling well or you know emotionally uh, you know challenged you know i was there and I, and i tried to be as steady and grounded for the students as possible and i think that's really what i feel we can offer and i think that dabbling in their psychoanalytics or you know or getting too involved in their life which i've also done you know to try and keep them there you know and hear their problems and try and get involved in their life stories is a risky business that never works in the end you know and i think that also on a western perspective what we're framing our points of context in is a very superficial view of reality where you haven't got the karmas right and you've got the three types of karma as you know probably david you know, the main bulk, bulk of your karma is the, the student will do as they as their karma suggests and that karma is their body energy you could call it genetics their upbringing the so you know there's a big load of karma that's brought to this equation you know and so i always say that you can take the horse to water but you can't make them drink or, or at least you can help them drink you know what i find is you can help them drink for a while but that takes a lot of energy and they drop off in the end anyway you know if they're going to drop off and it's not the, the if the karma isn't there whatever we want to call that in western uh paradigm then they're not going to stick at it and you know and and, and that's and it's also so sad as well because sometimes you know that it would be great for the person you know you, you can see that they need it and that you would help and it has been helping them but whatever in their life they just it's not right and they just can't stick at it you know um but you have to let go and you have to realize your place as a teacher without hubris you know like you're not jesus you know like you know, like you're just someone who can hold a bit of space right like and, and hold a bit of space for people if they they can bring their intentionality in, into that space you can be supportive in in helping provide that context but in terms of an ultimate motivator i'm not sure you know i mean and I don't think it necessarily helps to have an over-inspiring teacher anyway. I mean, my first teacher, as you know, was John, John Scott, very inspiring. Was he motivating in that inspiration? For me, not necessarily, actually. You know, he was doing, you know, everything he could, but it was John's show. I mean, you know, and it still is John's show, you know. I mean, and for me, that wasn't motivating, right? You know, that, that was him, you know, and John, and I didn't want to be John. I wanted to be me you know in my yoga you know and so you know coming back to the idea of space providing that space and allowing the person to turn up as they are with you know in whatever way that they feel is the ultimate motivator but it's not something you actively do really as uh, as just kind of heaviness to allow but it's a very fantastic and interesting question which i will always by dying breath as a so-called teacher, which I still don't really accept that mantle because I'm not teaching information as it were, really. Um, you know, I'm wanting people to find themselves in this, you know? And uh, yeah, so I would like, would like to be as odorless, I don't know how smelly I am, as colorless, you know, and as in, inobtrusive as possible in the whole equation, really, you know? Um, Catherine, did you have, you had your hand up? No, you all right? Um, yeah, I want to also. Want to oh, chat box. I'm gonna chat. Elizabeth. I mean, dealing with the ego, the many levels, Western culture and Eastern culture isn't. Um, how deep can you give up or let yourself, someone teach you, come in? Yeah, I mean, I think this idea of surrender and devotion is a really interesting one because it's there as something, but you know, I think we've already been burnt by the idea, and then the whole guru thing more recently again has as as re-traumatized. From uh, the original trauma of the church and the upbringing you know um, in uh, you know traditional religions let's say then we adopt eastern religions we have the same problem again you know these gurus uh, turn up in, in in disappointing and shameful ways and you know so uh, see, devotion is a tricky one isn't it but but devoting to something higher than yourself is is fundamental and my relationship with Sharat, although i'm a very rational pragmatic thinker you know I still got something out of the idea of him as a figurehead of something other than myself. And I didn't really 
contextualize him as the giver of knowledge necessarily or the giver of, of an experience that I wanted but it was more the idea of the principle of surrender rather than the literal surrender to a person and I think if you can do that and if you can take it away from the literal then I think surrender and devotion are very very useful in practice but I think if you make them too literal then I think you stand to get burnt by any teacher who you know, and there's so many teachers, many I can name them, contemporaries of mine who, can, who, ha, who have um, also um, in, in students devoting to them overly, um, unfortunately caused, you know, perhaps unintentionally harm. Um, so, um, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a tricky line to, to tread this, this uh, sacrifice, devotion, you know, it's there in the text, it's, you know, my book will study later is the Bhagavad Gita, it's there in the Gita. Um, so all the time Krishna is saying devote to me sacrifice to me um, but uh, you know it's it's not an easy thing to embody with with a, 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 a teacher these days I'd say and especially as we don't have the obvious original paradigm which was guru to disciple which was such a specific methodology for a specific place in time when the guru and the teacher lived together you know, and it was a completely different thing. Whereas now, you know, Ashtanga teachers, etc., are asking a student to to devote to them or surrender to them, and then they see them like a few times a week for an hour a day or something. And it's you know, it's 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 a very different situation we find ourselves in. You know, in which the, this kind of talk is is really redundant. You know, um, I want to talk about the energy. Sorry, I'm going to break it now and move on to the idea of the energy comes into existence through use that through using our energy, not preserving it, that we actually, you know, and I, was it, was it say, who was it says, I'd like to be fully spent when I die? I, uh, that was the quote he, he uses in Master. I can't remember who, who he quotes there. I'm going to say Greta Garbo, but I don't think it was. Um, yeah, Nicola, it's page 120. Um, <laughs> see, I did the research, I did the homework. Um, and, uh, you know, and the idea of energy being used and how to use it and, and, and you know, and, how to practice when one's depleted um, and you're on the plateau and day in, day out, you know, you face circumstances and you come to finding yourself without, without inspiration to practice, which happens to everyone. And I think, you know, you know, we need to speak to that as well. I mean, it's the most popular topic that I discuss when, on social media, how to find continued inspiration for practice when you don't feel it, you know? Um, and he suggests, first of all, we need to maintain fitness Fit, essential physical fitness and digestive fitness more than jumping around make sure your digestion is working well because that will you know the, the stomach is the second body that, the second mind they say you need to have a good digestion and that's you know that's all even talked about in the Bhagavad Gita raising agni this idea of yoga raising agni the, the fire the digestive fire fundamental you know it's absolutely fundamental in, in practice to raise your digestive fire and that will give you vitality and fitness right it's not about muscle building, it's about the digestion, right? And so you need that because it affects hugely the mind. You know, I mean, that was massive for me, moving on to a more sensible diet. It really changed everything, probably more than the physical yoga that I did. Um, so, you know, to maintain energy, you need fitness, right? You need mental fitness, you need physical fitness to get mental fitness. And you need to acknowledge the negative as well. So I think also at a certain point, need to also, and the beauty of the yoga system for me was, coming into a place where I felt supported enough in the physical practice of the sequences and being held by a class situation and by the sequence, that I could acknowledge my mental stuff without feeling overwhelmed by it. That it felt that it was a safe enough holding space to allow that negative talk that I spent the rest of the day trying to squash or deny, and which is very painful as well, you know, to allow out. So I think there's an important part is to, acknowledge the, ne the negativity that's in all of us, the darker side, whilst uh, not dwelling on it, right? We need to, you know, somehow accommodate honesty and, um, you know, the, this negative self chatter in the practice as well. Otherwise, constantly suppressing it and this idea these days that we have, you know, we have to constantly be positive, everything's awesome, everything, you know, must be, um, how is it, what is it? Um, the law of attraction, people say, what do you think about the law of attraction? And this to me, um, you know, I'm not a fan because I think, you know, honesty 
is is the ultimate energy you know coming into your authentic space of self and the good and the bad you know it'll, it'll, it'll give you energy you can hear the call to prayer you hear that yeah so it's nice in the first few days and then it starts to get a bit annoying um anyway so acknowledge the negative i think it gives you energy uh, um next telling the truth telling the truth also gives you energy it's like acknowledging the negative right telling the truth about yourself to yourself is fundamental um honor but don't indulge your dark side yeah so you don't dwell in it but you have to acknowledge it right um, there's two different things you know dwelling on it and acknowledging it two different things uh and fifthly he says priorities firm your priorities up people say well i have the money to do yoga right i don't have the time to do yoga well it's like well you don't have you know i mean yeah if we talk about two hours of advanced practice well they often you know need money and they need time you know but i mean you know we're talking about you know 30 minutes for yourself a day 20 minutes for yourself a day that you know that needs neither time nor money you know that that's priorities that's simply a game of priorities right so set your priorities and even when you know that there's other priorities you have they're impacting on the yoga priority just acknowledge that and see how they play and one priority is going out and getting drunk right and the other priority is yoga and then it's like acknowledge those priorities right and like just see what works for you in all honesty right you know because i did that as well like priority was going out and getting drunk for me you know it was a certain period of life that because i started when i was 20 and you know with my mates that was an important part of our culture um in essex you know another priority was yoga right so you have to you shift those priorities and see where they all land and in the in the in the power of your own honesty you gradually shift those priorities and you come to a more you know efficient balance for your life right so priorities assessing your priorities and see what priority impacts another priority and finally commit you know at a certain point you have to decide am i going to do it and am i going to not you know like and give it a chance you know give it a chance and see if it works you know right uh because i think you're constantly questioning constantly doubting which i do uh, the, it comes to a point where you just have to say okay just shut up and just try it for a while and just come back in six months and see how you feel you know like and um you know because doing loads of different things as well it's like the idea of digging you know in another metaphor you're digging all these wells and you only you never get water until you dig one well and kind of dig it deep enough to get to the water and i think these days especially where we've got so much fomo you know and um, <laughs> i had to put that in somewhere and uh, you know and uh, you know we always do all the different things you know because we don't want to miss out and um i think it's not popular just to do one thing because you're seen as unbalanced it's obsessive it's not balanced it's not normal but it is you know what's unbalanced is just doing all these many many things half arsely you know and not having any commitment or focus or lifestyle choice, you know, or, or pattern of living or attitude to life, that's unbalanced. That's a mess, you know, like this, you know, like committing to one principle and going ahead with that one principle in life, you know, that gives you power, you know, it, it's putting all your all your focus into your, into your, you know, your, your one thrust of energy, you know, tremendous power in that. You know? So I, I really like those. It's on page 120 if you want to go back to reading it. Members, if you're watching on video as well. And um, just just looking at how you build the energy to continue practice. You know? um, right, so we get to the end of our chat. And um, don't forget, you can always continue it in the members forum. We'd love to encourage some chat over that members forum. You're not a chatty bunch. So um, <laughs> chat to us. Teresa loves uh, chatting to uh, anyone she can, even me. So, um, you know, um, please, uh, you know, let us know what you think of the discussion. And if you have any other comments or questions, just uh, put it in the members forum uh, or the WhatsApp group we're building. If you haven't joined the WhatsApp group, send your number to us. We'll put you on. All right. Um, name of the book again, Catherine. It's Mastery by George Leonard. Mastery by George Leonard. Yeah. Um, but message me if you if you if you get stuck. All right. Okay, guys. Good to see you all. Short and sweet. I have one short question. When do you choose the next book for? Yeah, how, put, yeah. How is the rhythm of the? Uh... Put some recommendations. That's a good point. Put some recommendations for the next book. I've got some ideas, but I'm not hard and fast on what they are. So yeah, got a recommendation? Let me read it. I'd love to read something new. Um, yeah. Do you have one? 
Well, if... uh, I'm reading now one really good. It's a very small book. Uh, it's right. called Asana and Injury, the Matthew Vollmer. I don't know oh. if you heard about Hello, him. Hello, Matthew. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. He had a really nice book about Asana and Injury into Ashtanga Yoga. And uh, I didn't finish it yet, so I cannot talk too much about it. But uh, I just got it, and it's a very nice book. All right. I'll have a look for it. I'll see if I can get it. And, uh, and you know, another thing is, can we get these easily, these books? That's another thing to bear in mind. You know, can, are they accessible to everyone easily? Um, yeah, I bought it from a, a Shala in Berlin that yeah. they translated it to English. So, yeah. 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 But it's not right. easy to, yeah. Let's have a little look and see if I can find it. And uh, that sounds great. Yeah. I actually mean to, to message Matthew for a, for a chat, a podcast or something. So we will get to chat. All right. Any other recommendations? And, uh, and don't forget to, to mention them because, yeah, we, we, uh, we want to continue the book club. So, yeah, please give us your thoughts. It could be in anything. Nicola, it could be your diet. It could be, you know, spoon fed's a great one, for example. You know, it could be in anything. You know, it doesn't have to be yoga per se, but, you know, in a broader context. All right. Awesome book. Yeah, it is. All right. Cheers, guys. See you soon. Thanks. Enjoy Istanbul. <laughs> yeah, we will. Yeah, go we ahead. are. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm going to rush the prayer now. All right. Bye. <laughs> Good one. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.